Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my variety vlog covering May 2019, and as always, I have a bunch of different things that I'll be covering. Uh, we have a general update where I'll be talking a little bit about how I've been doing emotionally and motivation-wise for the channel over the last month, and there's been some ups and downs. I will also cover three questions, five new games that I acquired, and 16 new games that I learned about over these last four weeks. Now, before I jump into all of that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support this channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. You will find a variety of ways with which you can support the channel, and there are some pretty cool perks uh, involved with some of those including voting on a couple of the videos that I make each month. All right, let's now jump into the updates, and we'll start with a very brief Patreon campaign update. There were 10 new people who joined into the campaign over this last month. Um, now, that is just great, so <laughs> thank you so much for the new support, and again, a uh, continued uh, support for everyone who has been supporting this channel for years now, and the other hundreds of people who are continuing to keep that up. I just really appreciate it. Now let's talk about the main update that I have for the channel this uh, month. And realistically, it's more of a, a John update, <laughs> specifically like how I am doing uh, with this job that I'm doing. Uh, this is not a very well-defined update, if I'm being honest, but I had some pretty rough moments over the last month when it comes to um, me emotionally uh, and this channel. And I figured, well, I should talk about it. Like that's what this vlog is kind of about. And uh, we can start off by saying, I think this happened because I just hit the five-year mark for the channel. You know, I talked about that in the last variety vlog, and I was pretty um, uh, high emotionally about that um, when I filmed that variety vlog. But within a few days of uh, publishing that video, for some reason, I just kind of fell down into some some not great places <laughs> emotionally. You know, I started looking at a bunch of data, you know, kind of uh, correlating a bunch of data, putting it into a spreadsheet and analyzing it and seeing some things that, you know, really don't, don't make me feel great. You know, one thing in particular that jumped out to me when I uh, looked at the subscriber count that I've had per month for the entire five years that I've been doing this, well, I realized that that number has been essentially flat for the last three years. And three years out of five years is a pretty significant amount. And, you know, realizing that, you know, at this point, three years ago, my daily subscriber gain was effectively identical to what it is right now was, I don't know, a bit of a punch to the gut. <laughs> you know, uh, over the last three years, I have dedicated so much time and energy to increasing the quality of these videos and increasing the quantity of these videos. And just seeing, you know, becoming a uh, professional, like, you know, uh, you know, making my old job go part-time and all that, just dedicating so much time, getting a studio space, all of this equipment, all of this effort, and then just seeing that number not budge it's frustrating. You know, you really want to see, you know, the, the numbers just keep going up and up. And it's nice to see that they've been linear. You know, it could be worse. It could be going down. And obviously there are many, many people who get less subscriber, uh, subscriber growth on a daily basis than I do. So what ended up happening is I was in the doldrums. I, I really had a lot of uh, difficulty getting motivation to film some stuff. And I ended up having a couple good conversations with friends and a couple very good conversations with my wife, uh, Jessica, just kind of running through everything, trying to figure out why I was where I was at. And I think we figured out one pretty important thing. And that was that I've really been burning the candle at all ends for about a year and a half now. Um, you know, my previous job, which you may or may not be familiar with, is the fact that I, uh, I've i been doing event lighting for 12 years. And that job has a variable schedule, and I usually work like crazy in the months of April and May and September, October, um, and then December for the Christmas holiday uh, party season. And, you know, when, when I was doing that full time in September, I would get like one or two days off for the entire month. But then January, well, nobody parties in January, so... So I would have like 15 days off in that month. And so things would kind of be counterbalanced. I would have crazy months and I would have really relaxed months. And overall, over the course of a year, I would end up working about 2,000 hours, which is relatively average for most people um, with full-time jobs. Now, what's happened over the last year and a half when I've gone part-time with my old job and part-time with John Gets Games is the fact that when my other job gets light, I have filled in all of that time with John Gets Games, you know, working eight hours a day for all of that time. But then when my other job kind of ramps up again, even though I'm part-time with them, I continue to try and fit, fit John Gets Games into all of those cracks. So what this means is I used to have really low uh, uh, working hours in a month uh, for some of the months and really high ones and they averaged out really well. But now what's happened is I never have a low time. You know, when it's crazy at my other job, I'm still trying to get videos done. And then when it's not crazy at my other job, I'm just working full time for John Gets Games. So I never have those low uh, months to try and kind of recenter myself and have lots of time to like explore other creative interests and whatnot. And I've just been going crazy, uh, you know, 
know, just dedicating so much time to this. And on top of all of that, I've been working six days a week for the last year and a half. Uh, I've given myself every single Sunday off, which is certainly nice. But those other six days, you know, they, they've been dedicated to work because, well, parties happen on Saturdays. So I work almost every single Saturday. And so part of my conversation with Jessica involved us kind of coming to this realization and saying that, I really need to get two days off a week on average. You know, if if my schedule is going to be kind of steady like this, where it uh, kind of varies between the two jobs, but I'm still working consistently, well, I just can't do the six days a week thing because it's it's slowly burning me out, and that's certainly not good. So. Over the last three weeks or so, I've been trying to make that happen, you know, try to uh, dedicate two full days a week to not doing anything that will make me money. And I think that's been helping out a little bit overall. Um, that's certainly not a silver bullet to kill um, all of the issues that I've been having, but it's definitely helped. Um, another big part of um, kind of coming out of it, because if I'm being honest, I, I'm in a better spot now than I was three weeks ago, for sure. I'm not, you know, super high, you know, everything is amazing right now. Like things are still definitely, um, you know, they're, they, they can be hard and they fluctuate, but I have a little bit more motivation, but I've realized that I need to look at things differently. Like in general, in life, I am a pretty optimistic person. Uh, you know, the glass is half full and all of that, but I think working so hard has kind of shifted that away. I've become more pessimistic. And, you know, when it comes to this um, channel as, you know, a glass of water that has, is half full, I've been really looking at it as half empty for, you know, well, certainly the beginning of this month. And I keep finding myself looking at the numbers that aren't going up as much as I'd like. And, you know, the number of... <laughs> publishers that I might email that don't actually email me back or the amount of uh, lack of engagement that I get when I try to professionally work with other people. But then, you know, having these conversations with Jessica and I really uh, kind of realized that I need to flip this over. Like I am inherently an optimistic person. I need to not fall into the trap of pessimism and look back at the same glass and say, this is half full. Like I still have great subscriber growth every single day of, you know, the year. You know, I look at those numbers and sure, the number right now is about the same as it was three years ago. But three years ago, that number was still pretty good. You know, it averages, you know, something like 16 or 17 uh, subscribers a day. And that's great. You know, the fact that it has stayed um, flat, it's still, you know, a flat curve that goes up. So the subscriber count keeps going up. You know, publishers do reach out to me. Many other ones do. And I have done a good job of making a reasonable living with these sponsored playthroughs that I've been doing. And, you know, the overall... Um, interactions that I've had with people uh, throughout time, I think has gotten better in comments on these videos. I haven't actually looked at any data for that, but I really do feel like my videos get a lot more comments they do uh, these days than they did three years ago. And so there are all of these other metrics that I need to kind of try to pay attention to, to pull myself out of these little funks. And I know that these funks will happen again in the future. It's just kind of one of the inherent things that comes with being uh, uh, self-employed and especially being self-employed by myself. Like I don't have a partner that I'm working with. It's just me in this room. And, you know, part of, uh, I think, uh, these funks comes from, uh, just being lonely as well. You know, I just being in this little studio all day long, talking to myself, talking at this camera, you know, it can be fun sometimes, but other times it feels like, you know, this is my entire world now. And I am a very social person. So either way, I'm trying to work through all this stuff. I don't have any silver bullets, but I am trying to give myself two days off a week, which is kind of revolutionary for me, but I think pretty standard for most other people. And I think that kind of wraps up everything I want wanted to have, say about this. I just, I don't know. I felt like this was a good medium for me to talk very honestly about how things are going. You know, um, I am not going to be uh, pulling the plug or anything like that. I'm just really trying to look at this from my very uh, third person perspective, you know, try to not be so emotionally attached to things and try to, you know, just keep the ship going forward and uh, be very honest with myself. Because, um, you know, if I just keep saying, yeah, everything's fine, everything's fine, then I might end up just bottling everything up until the bottle breaks and then, you know, everything goes up. So I certainly don't want that to happen. And I certainly am rambling about this more than I should. So that's going to bring this section to a close. Next up, we can move into the upcoming schedule for the next four weeks. Uh, as always, these are my plans for the videos that will be coming out. Uh, things might change a little bit once we actually get to these uh, spots. But right now for week 22, I'm planning on putting out a uh, playthrough for Trouble in Temple Town, which is a cooperative game about trying to uh, stave off infections in a uh, person. And I'm also going to be putting out a playthrough for Shiver Me Timbers, which is kind of a sandbox pirate style game that I actually filmed and fully edited like three months ago or so, and then shipped that one off to somebody else. So that one has been ready and waiting for a while. In week 23, I'm going to be putting out a playthrough for for The Few and The Cursed. And then after that, I'm also going to do my impressions vlog covering all of the new games that I played for the month of May. And then in week 24, I am planning on putting out uh, the uh, Patreon voted playthrough. Now, I don't know what that is because I've not sent out that poll just yet, um, but I have a 
couple games that um, that certainly could make uh, make the list for that one. So I'm curious to see how that goes. And then finally, we have week 25, where I will put out the next one of these variety vlogs. And I am also going to be putting out a playthrough for the Dwellings of Eldervale. Um, that is uh, one that I've actually just uh, got in the mail just uh, about a week ago, and I have not dug into that one yet. But I am going to be doing that playthrough for week 25. All right, let's now move on to the next segment, which are questions and answers. I ran out of questions last month, and I asked for some, and many people sent them in, so I appreciate that. I have more than I will be covering today, but if you have questions you would like me to answer in a future vlog, then please send those over to johngetsgames at gmail.com, and I will add them into the list. So I'm going to be talking about three questions this month, and the first one comes from Ray Combs, and they asked, uh, what is my favorite kind of uh, game to preview slash review or playthrough, and why? Now, there are many different ways I could take this uh, from mechanics and uh, overall styles of games, and I think that's probably the way I will start. Um, you know, one way to kind of section out board games in general is cooperative games and competitive games. And while I like doing both of those for the uh, playthroughs for the channel, I do think I slightly prefer filming the competitive games to the cooperative ones because it's a little bit easier for me mentally to wrap my head around what the players are going to be doing. Uh, in a competitive game that I am simulating by doing the playthrough, I can really have the players focus on what they know for sure and what they think their opponents might do to try and uh, do the uh, best things for that one particular player. Whereas in a cooperative game, I have to simulate all of the players sharing information back and forth and trying to really push uh, towards a winning game state for everyone around the table. So I find that cooperative games can sometimes be a little bit more, uh, they have a little bit more to crunch than the average competitive game does. Now, um, another way to look at uh, things that I like versus uh, uh, like less is I do prefer filming playthroughs for fully published games. I know that I do quite a few playthroughs for Kickstarters, and those always involve prototypes. And, you know, the rules for those games are usually not as fleshed out as the rules are for fully published games. So there's um, a decent amount more work that goes into those Kickstarter games, you know, usually um, at least two to three hours of extra work as I'm parsing through the rules, you know, writing back a bunch of questions to the publisher saying, how does this work and how does that work? And what is this component right here? I can't quite figure it out. So there is extra time that goes into making um, the uh, Kickstarter style games. But, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of publishers who want to support, um, who want uh, sponsored playthroughs done for their games, well, most of them have Kickstarter campaigns going because that's just kind of where the industry is at right now for a lot of the small to medium sized publishers who uh, work with me. Um, I have been uh, lucky enough to have several uh, sponsored playthroughs come out over the last four to five weeks that were fully published games. And so that is something that I am definitely trying to emphasize and trying to make happen more as I'm reaching out to publishers and trying to deal with them. But um, in general, it does seem like more sponsored playthroughs are uh, prototypes. And I kind of wish that wasn't the case, but I think that's just kind of one of the realities of uh, the business right now. Um, when it comes to overall mechanics, um, you know, I personally like engine building and incentivization and hand management and all that kind of stuff. And so I like to see those in the games that I do playthroughs for. Uh, but I think when it comes to something that may really makes me more excited to play it, um, well, that's going to be a generic thing that I could say where when I'm reading the rules, I say, oh, that's cool. I haven't seen this done like that before. And those are the kind of things that really do make me more um, interested versus um, other games that I do do uh, playthroughs for that are good games that bring things together well, but maybe don't necessarily do something in particular that seems uh, significantly different from other games that I see. So I try to obviously hone in and only say yes to uh, games that I think are going to be interesting and bring new things uh, to the gaming space. Um, sometimes I am uh, better at picking those games than others, but either way, I hope that gives you a general idea of uh, what I enjoy when it comes to filming these playthroughs. Um, uh, all of the uh, questions that I'll be answering this month actually have to do with filming playthroughs, and we can now move into the second question, and this one comes from Kevin Smith, and they ask, when filming a playthrough, how much time do I spend thinking through each player's turn? Uh, they know that this will vary from game to game, but compared to if I was playing my game myself for real, do I spend less, more, or about the same amount of time when I'm filming? Now, uh, this is pretty easy to answer. I could say that I spend way more time trying to decide what I will do on a player's turn when I'm filming versus when I'm playing games with my friends. Uh, I can uh, say that quite easily because looking at um, the time I, I take to actually record all of these videos, um, the average um, game that I do is probably like 
eight to 10 hours to film the overall game. And that would be for a game that would normally take maybe like 90 to 120 minutes when playing with friends. Uh, so obviously that is a huge amount of time and a big part of that has to do with me really thinking through a player's turn and then trying to think through the other player's turns. Uh, what are they gonna do and how am I gonna play off of that? And the fact that um, me personally as a gamer, I I, I am a, uh, a hidden AP uh, a person, you know, analysis paralysis is uh, something that I definitely lean towards, but the societal pressures of trying to play games at, uh, at a reasonable uh, rate when I'm playing with my friends is enough for me to just, you know, shut up and just, you know, take a turn and stop really uh, thinking through all of the ramifications. But if I'm sitting here in my studio with just me and a whole day to record the video, or, you know, oftentimes multiple days to get these recorded, I... I kind of can't help but take as much time as I need, and I am actively trying to do this less because the less time I spend filming means the more time I have to make more videos. And so the fact that it takes on average about 13 hours to make these videos, you know, when I include editing and reading rules and all that kind of stuff, well, that's just longer than I would like. So I'm trying to make it uh, shorter, but I'm, I'm struggling with that. And I think it just has to do with me Cult, uh, carefully uh, crafting each one of these playthroughs, you know, trying to guide each one of the players towards all of the game mechanics as soon as possible so that people watching the video will know how to play the game. And that means sometimes I try to uh, push the overall game state into a situation where a specific mechanic gets taught. Like maybe, you know, nobody is fighting the dragon or whatever it is, you know, well, I'm going to spend a moment, you know, and by a moment, I mean maybe 10 minutes figuring out what they're going to do, what they're going to do, what they're going to do to set the game state up so that fighting the dragon makes sense so that I can then fight the dragon in a way that feels organic to the people watching the video, but also I can get to that mechanic and I don't, you know, it's not like an hour and 15 minutes in before I teach a vital thing because, you know, sometimes when you're playing uh, games, certain um, actions and certain options just don't happen until very late in the game or sometimes not at all. So I spend a significant amount of time making sure every single aspect to the game gets taught in a timely manner and, uh, you know, just trying to tell a good story with every one of these playthroughs. And when you sit down to play a game with your friends, not every play of a game goes super great for everyone. And when I'm filming these playthroughs, I really try to keep everybody in the game. I try to really uh, make decisions that make sense for everybody, but also keep an overall sense of tension because, you know, this is entertainment and I'm trying to make entertaining videos. So uh, it takes um, obviously a lot longer to do all of those things. And I like to think that the extra time that I take to make these playthroughs make uh, creates a higher quality uh, product than if I just uh, kind of rushed through and just did the first thing that I thought. And oftentimes found myself in uh, situations where I'm not teaching the mechanic or this player is playing awfully like why did they do this thing well because I just decided to just do a turn to move on and you know I I guess I I care too much about making a very high quality product probably higher quality than I necessarily need to and again I'm trying to film these things faster because that would just be better for me overall but it is uh it's it's hard to do you know I've filmed um well over 100 of these playthroughs now so I'm very kind of stuck in my ways and unfortunately my ways involve taking a long time to take turns uh sometimes I will be editing and you know I'm kind of clipping through uh, throwing out all of the empty space and I'll kind of click on a, a region where I just haven't talked for a minute and I see my hand on screen you know just like pushing this over here, thinking, thinking, and I'm like, holy cow, I sat there staring at the board for 15 minutes, you know, before I made a decision, and in that moment, I probably wasn't coming up with one player's turn for 15 minutes, I was probably planning out, like, three or four sets of turns for these players, and the next few would kind of go quickly, but it really does ebb and flow, even within the games that I'm filming. Uh, so, I hope that answers your question, Kevin, and uh, Kevin did send another question in. Um, this one is, again, related to the overall uh, playthrough filming process. Uh, they said, do I spend more time um, on the focus player and less on others, or about the same for each. Now, uh, for context uh, for this question from Kevin Smith, um, when I'm doing these playthroughs, obviously I like to have one player be us, you know, it's like me and you, the viewer, and then I try to spend less time explaining what the other opponent characters are doing to try and simulate as if we were, you know, the person playing through the game. And I think I spent about the same amount of time for the focus character, uh, focus player, and all of the other people because, again, I'm trying to craft that experience, that um, overall tense gameplay where everybody's really close and everybody's jockeying and um, trying to do the best they can. And in order to do that, I really do have to spend a lot of time for all of these different players. Now, obviously, I 
I t like to uh, speak out all of the different thoughts that I'm having as I am figuring out my turn as the active player, but um, I just don't spend that time with the other opponents on screen, you know, um, on film anyway. I just think all of that through, and I do that player's turn, and then I move on. So, yeah, I think on average, it's about the same for all of these uh, players. Uh, that's going to wrap up the uh, very playthrough filming-oriented questions that I got this month. Uh, I do have a couple more that I will be uh, covering next month, but again, if you have questions you would like me to answer, then please send those over to johngetsgames at gmail.com, and I will add them onto the list. Okay, let's now move on to the Shifting Shelf segment. This is where I talk about the new games that I acquired over the last four or so weeks and the games that I had to remove from the collection to make room for these. Now, uh, this is not always balanced, and as you can see, I've got a lot more games than I have removed. Uh, we can start with the games that I acquired. Um, first of all was Belrati. Uh, I talked about this one in my BGGCon wrap-up from last year. This is a uh, lightweight, kind of uh, a fully cooperative uh, game of trying to deduct things and uh, different types of player roles. I really enjoy this one. It kind of has a uh, Mysterium sort of vibe, and I, I liked it enough to reach out to the publisher and buy this one uh, straight from them. Uh, I also got a copy of Corinth. Uh, this is a review copy that was sent over by Asmodee. This is a new um, a role and write style game that is kind of a uh, re-implementation sort of of Yispahan, which was a dice game that came out. I think 10 years ago or so that I, I played probably about nine or 10 years ago. Uh, so I'm looking forward to trying uh, Corinth, but I have not had a, sh a chance just yet. Um, just yesterday, I finally got my copy of Die Tavernen im Tiefenthal. Um, I say that because I ordered this one on April 8th of last uh, last month, I guess, you know, in April. Um, I was having a really hard time finding a German uh, uh, seller who would actually ship this game over to the US. And I finally found one that would, and the shipping cost was really high. It was like 30 $5, but I really wanted to get this game early. I could tell it was totally language independent, and um, I wanted to cover that one on the channel. Unfortunately, it got stuck in customs for seven weeks. It showed up yesterday after seven weeks of, um, uh, after uh, seven weeks after it was shipped, and I'm very excited to play this one. It's the new Wolfgang Warsh game, um, and it looks like it's got a lot of really interesting dice and deck building ideas kind of crammed together. So now that I finally have this copy, I am looking forward to playing it. Um, I also got a copy of Mysthia. Now, this was sent over by the publisher because the um, uh, playthrough that I filmed and uh, put out la uh, last week, this week, depending on when you are uh, watching this, was called Mysthia the Fall, and that uh, game required the uh, full version of Mysthia, which came out last year, and this new game called Icaon, which is on Kickstarter. You use pieces from both of those board games in order to uh, play this fully cooperative game, even though both of the previous games are competitive. This means they had to send me a full version of Mysthia to do that playthrough, and that means that I have a copy of Mysthia. I have not played this one yet. It's got a bunch of miniatures. It seems like it's kind of an area control sort of game, and I am intrigued to give it a shot. Uh, and the other game that I uh, picked up was uh, Visitor in Blackwood Grove. I already covered my thoughts on this one because I got it played immediately after I got it. I talked about that in my impressions vlog that came out just a couple weeks ago. Uh, now, in terms of games that have left the collection, I I only pulled one out of the off the shelf this uh, month, and that was Noctiluca. I talked about my impressions of this one just a couple months ago. It is a kind of puzzly, uh, dice-grabbing uh, style game of set collection, and it didn't really do much for me, and it definitely activated everyone's analysis paralysis around the table. So, unfortunately, I don't think that one really deserved to stay on the shelf for us. It just did not really click for us. And, you know, I'm only taking one game off of the shelf this month, and I I'll tell you that next month there will likely be a lot more that come off because the uh, biannual flea market at Victory Point Games in, uh, sorry, Victory Point Cafe in downtown Berkeley is going to be happening in just a couple weeks, and every time that flea market comes around, I try to do a bigger purge to try and, you know, sell a bunch of games and, you know, get some extra support so that I can buy more games to cover on the channel. So I'm not really sure what I'm going to be pulling off the shelf just yet. I, I have some hard decisions uh, available uh, in front of me for that one, and I decided to push that off a couple weeks. So I only took one game off the shelf uh, for this uh, month, but yeah, there will be quite a few more next month. Um, either way, that's going to wrap up the shifting shelf, and that means we are now uh, moving into the big biggest uh, section of this variety vlog, and that is the games to uh, watch section. Now for that, I'm going to bring out my laptop right here and uh, just kind of run through these. Um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, essentially I pay attention to every single new game that gets added onto Board Game Geek, and then once a month I talk about the games that uh, in particular stood out to me that I want to keep paying attention to. Uh, this month I have less than I covered in the last couple months. There are just 16 games that I will be talking about, and I have put them into alphabetical order, and I'm just going to kind of um, rush right through these and talk about why they have stuck out to me and why I'm interested in learning more about them. 
Uh, so let's go ahead and start off with the first one. And actually the first two are pretty similar. Um, one is called Almanac the Crystal Peaks and the other one is Almanac the Dragon Road. Both of these are designed by Scott Olms and they're both being published by Colossal Games. And the reason I'm paying attention to these is because I am curious about what's going on here. Uh, there are, there's just uh, images of the box uh, tops. There is no images of how the game plays. And looking at the details, it says this is a, a auction slash bidding game with dice rolling, pick up and deliver, and worker placement. And um, both of these games have the same mechanics. Uh, looking at the details, it says that um, it, it seems like this Almanac thing is going to be kind of a series of games, and the descriptions are virtually identical between these two games. So uh, looking at the uh, details right here, it says that um, you are going to be... That's right. Um, uh, each round of an Almanac game is played on a different page of a game book. Each page represents a unique location slash board with a special twist on worker placement when combined with an innovative bidding mechanism for turn order and a vast array of fantasy encounters, every game of Almanac is going to be a new experience. Um, now, again, both of these Almanac games seem to have a virtually identical uh, set of descriptions, so I'd like to see a little bit more and see what's really going on with this Almanac um, uh, mechanic and, you know, how it differs from one version of the game to the next. All right, let's move on to the third-ish game, I guess. Uh, this one is Crystal Palace. Uh, now, the reason this one jumped out to me is mostly because the publisher is Forland Spiel. Uh, they have put out many great games in the past, like uh, Gaia Project, as well as Terra Mystica and uh, Magnus Storm that came out last year, and Fuji, just lots of good games. And so that's enough for me to pay attention. Uh, the me uh, mechanisms for this say variable phase order and worker placement. Um, it says that you're going to take on the role of a nation in the time of the uh, World's Fair, um, the first World's Fair in London, in 1851. Um, it's a dice placement game in which players are determining the stats of their dice at the beginning of each round. The higher the number, the better, but it comes with a price. So it does have some photos of people playing this game, and that is the other reason why I'm paying attention to this, because I like dice placement games in general, and that description leads me to think that maybe you don't roll these dice. Maybe you always choose what the dice values will be before you actually take those actions, but then you have to decide, you know, whatever the cost or the temple loss is for the more powerful dice actions. Either way, I think this looks pretty cool. It says two to five players in 90 to 150 minutes. So it's certainly uh, not a quick game overall. And looking at the designer, it is um, Karsten Lauber. And according to Board Game Geek, this is the only game that is uh, listed for that designer. So I am definitely intrigued to learn more about the Crystal Palace. Um, moving on, we have Dazzling Dice Line in all caps. <laughs> uh, this is a, a new game coming out from Analog Lunchbox, which is a publisher who put out uh, Past Tally last year. Now, um, I picked up a copy of Past Tally from this publisher, and I thought it was a really interesting, vibrantly uh, 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 illustrated game. Um, Past Tally, in particular, was a game about making little paths and trying to stack a bunch of um, tiles on top of each other. And this game is uh, pretty different. Um, it's, again, got a similar kind of minimalistic but vibrant artistic style. And it says that um, this is a dice-rolling worker placement style game with a pretty cool mechanic. In fact, the rules have been published for this one, so I read through those, and I am very interested to have an opportunity to try this. Um, the base idea here is you're going to roll um, this subset of dice, which will be four dice per player, and there are three different colors, and then you'll put them on a grid, starting with high number of dice and then going down. So all the red are in a column, all the green are in a column, and all the gray are in a column. And then in reverse player order, you take a row of dice. So that means you have some dice drafting going on, and then the dice that you take will then um, dictate your options for placing these dice out onto worker placement spots. And then it looks like there might be a little bit of a pattern matching maybe tile placement uh, sort of thing going on. I, I kind of skimmed through the rules. I saw enough to make me very interested. So I am quite uh, looking forward to trying this one out. The designer is uh, Masaki Suga, and uh, looking at Board Game Geek, they were indeed the designer of Past Tally, so, and many other things, including Airship City, which came out last year. That looked like a, a somewhat heavyweight Euro game that I did not have a chance to try, but either way, I am definitely looking forward to uh, trying out Dazzling Dice Line. This game looks really neat. It says three to four players and 45 to 60 minutes, so that's uh, definitely right there in my wheelhouse. Uh, moving on, we now have Dinosauria. Uh, the uh, publisher for this one is Mana Bird Games, and when I look it up on Board Game Geek, this appears to be their first published title. And uh, the reason that I'm interested in this one has to do with the description um, and mechanics. It says a hand management, pattern building, set collection game, where thematically, essentially, a planet has been seeded with a whole bunch of dinosaurs from dinosaur DNA. So instead of having a Jurassic Park type of thing, where it's like an island full of dinosaurs, you now have a futuristic version of that with a planet called Dinosauria, where they've just seeded it with a whole bunch of 
these um, dinosaurs. And it looks like this is um, a game that has a lot of maybe like, yeah, hand management as a me uh, mechanism where you are drawing cards, building chains of dinosaurs and zones. You're sliding mana tokens on a grid to match patterns and generate food. Well, I, in general, like mechanics that have a visual aspect to them as you are pushing things around. So there are no images of how this game works, but I'm quite interested to learn more about how this mana sliding grid thing works. And overall, I think it's just a fun idea having a planet full of dinosaurs and uh, playing through it. So I'm not sure if this is definitely going to be a game I want to actively go out and uh, get, but I right now there are no photos of this game at all. So I'm following this one, subscribing to it on BoardGameGeek to learn more to see if this is a game that I want to... Uh, actually try to hunt down later on. Let's now move on to the next game, and this one is Ecos, The First Continent. Uh, now, the designer of this game is John D. Clare, and that is the main reason that this one jumped out to me. Uh, the publisher for it is Aldrac Entertainment Group, and the, this game does have an image of the box cover and the back, and they have published the rules to this one, so I, uh, I uh, skimmed through the rules on that. Actually, that's interesting. Looking at BoardGameGeek, they don't have the rules posted, but I do know that the official AEG page does have the rules that you can download because I already um, uh, read through them. And the reason this one jumped out to me has to do with um, the tempo of the game because this is a simultaneous action style game where you have a bag full of uh, different resource types and on a turn, a player pulls out one of these um, resources and then everyone gets to use that resource simultaneously and then you then pull another resource out and everyone gets to use it simultaneously. Uh, to a certain extent, it almost sounds like Tiny Towns uh, right at the start because that is also a game uh, from uh, AEG that has everybody working off the same stimulus. However, instead of doing pattern building and uh, uh, kind of adjacencies like in Tiny Town, in this case, it's all about engine building and uh, combos. Uh, you do have a little bit of uh, tile placement it looks like, but you are building up these combos. You're playing cards that will work off of different things and the resources that you use will kind of charge up different cards so that you can use them. And uh, I just really like everything that I saw in this game. It looks uh, like it's right down my alley. It says two to six players. And again, almost everything in this game happens simultaneously. I think, again, don't, don't quote me on that. I did read through the rules, but that was a few days ago and it was enough for me to be very interested in trying this one out. Uh, so hopefully I will have an opportunity to do that. Uh, I do think it's going to be a little bit until this game comes out, uh, but I uh, certainly want to try this one. Let's now move on to Exogenesis. Uh, now, this one's published by Bad Cat Games, and looking at Board Game Geek, they have a few games that uh, they've published, but I don't recognize any of them. But um, the reason this game uh, stood out to me was, well, I thought the theme kind of sounded neat, and the me uh, mechanisms are interesting enough for me to pay attention to it. There are no images of what this game looks like at this point, but as far as mechanics go, it's a cooperative game with a modular board, worker placement, and uh, it's got a civilization exploration type of vibe. Uh, the thing that really stuck out to me is that this is a cooperative game, but it describes it as a 4X style survival exploration game, where I guess you have all crash landed on an alien planet and you're trying to either escape the planet or learn the mystery of the planet and why you crash landed there. Um, that's kind of all I'm really getting from the uh, description, but um, I'm just curious to see what a 4X survival game looks like, because usually 4X means, you know, uh, gigantic empires exploring and exterminating and all that kind of stuff. Not necessarily being a spaceship that crash landed on a planet trying to survive. Um, it does appear to be fully cooperative. So uh, either way, I'm looking forward to seeing maybe some images of what this uh, game looks like in play and maybe some more information to see how these mechanics work because from a high level, I am certainly intrigued. Uh, we can now move on to the next game, and uh, this is Lorenzo Il Magnifico, the card game. Um, and that is enough. <laughs> That's enough for me to be intrigued by this game. Uh, my wife and I really enjoyed uh, Lorenzo Il Magnifico. We have a copy of it. Um, I've probably played it like six or seven times at this point, and it is a relatively brutal um, uh, worker placement engine building style game where you build out an engine, but you cannot, you can only activate your engine by going to specific worker placement spots, and those can be hotly contested. So it's a, a a punishing game where you can build out a beautiful engine and then really struggle to actually activate it. And I know for some people that really turn them off, but for some reason, we really quite like that. So um, looking at this one, the description is very simple. It just says, relive the majestic Renaissance period of Lorenzo El Magnifico as a card game. Uh, this game uses the en uh, an engine building mechanism with which players will develop their properties to increase their faith and military power to generate victory points. And that's all it says. Um, honestly, like I started this one off, um, just 
being a card game version of Lorenzo Il Magnifico is enough for me to be interested. Honestly, if you're playing Lorenzo Il Magnifico, it's a game full of cards. Like, that's how you build out your engine. So I always think it's kind of funny when you have a board game, the card game, when the original board game was mostly cards anyway. So uh, I'm curious to see what they do here. I mean, obviously, there were um, workers that you used as a worker placement type thing in the original game. And for this one, for mechanics, it says card drafting and set collection. It does not say worker placement or anything like that. So it seems like maybe the main mechanic for how you build out your engines will be different. But um, hopefully it has a very tense, tight um, engine building and uh, activation uh, mechanic to kind of go along with how the original game was. Either way, I'm excited to try it. It looks like it's the same designers. It says two to four players in 30 to 45 minutes. So that means it would be easily half the playtime of the original Lorenzo Il Magnifico. So maybe it's going to be a more streamlined version. But either way, I'd like to know more. Right now, there are no images of what this looks like on BoardGameGeek. Next up, we have a game called Marquesas. Uh, now this one, unfortunately, says it's not gonna come out until 2020. Um, and I say that because this one looks really interesting. Uh, the designers are Louis Maltz and Stefan Maltz, and they have designed many games in the past. Um, looking at Board Game Geek, they have uh, Altiplano as, a val as well as Rococo. Um, they also did Valparaiso, which came out last year and I was not super impressed by, but Rococo was great and Altiplano was a really good game. Uh, they designed Edo as well, but I have not had a chance to play that. Either way, um, a couple big reasons I want to try this is not only does uh, the designers have a pedigree of making really solid midweight Euro games, but just looking at the images of the prototypes they have on Board Game Geek makes all of my uh, Euro loving parts of my brain just, you know, explode. <laughs> like, this just looks like a Euro game that I would love. Um, the mechanics have area control, dice uh, uh, rolling, area movement, set collection, worker placement. Um, it says this game sets you, uh, sets the players as early Polynesians, and it's a dice placement game with resource conversion. Uh, to a medium weight Euro game where players jump from island to island to try and build huts, colonize islands, spread their culture and exchange goods. You will use dice as workers, specialist cards. You're going to move things around and do all sorts of Euro-y stuff. I'm just excited. <laughs> all these things uh, just hit all of the buttons of the uh, Euro game lover in me. So I'm very much looking forward to trying this one out uh, at some point in the future. The publisher is Alley Cat Games. And I do believe based off what I see on uh, Board Game Geek, that this one will be going on Kickstarter later on in 2019. And then I think being fulfilled in 2020 which is why um, it is going to be so far out. So we can now move on to the next game, which is Pinnacle. Uh, the publisher for this one is Mixlore. Uh, looking at BGG, they have a couple games. Skulk is one that just came out. Um, it's kind of a weird skull-like um, game, but either way, it looks like maybe the games that this publisher makes are relatively light. I'm not super familiar with them. In fact, they don't have a designer listed at all for this game. Uh, as far as details, they have an image of the box cover. It says it's a two to six player game. And it only takes 15 minutes and you are strategically stacking um, these precarious peaks. Players take turns stacking wooden blocks of various shapes to create perilous piles of laughter and risk hit risk taking fun. If the shapes fall, the game ends. Ideal for players of any age who love a tactile fun experience. Well, I like tactile fun experiences. I've certainly had a good time uh, with other stacking style games, and this one's probably relatively light. Um, going off of the uh, the box cover, it looks like there are a wide variety of different wooden shapes, and I'd like to learn more about it. It's certainly not something that's going to, you know, set my world on fire with excitement, but I don't know. I like stacking things up and then seeing them fall in a variety of different ways. And uh, I'm curious to see what well, the mechanics of this one are to um, see how it maybe differs from other games that do similar stuff. All right. Next up, we have Rolled West. Uh, this one is published by uh, Tasty Mitchell Games. Designer is Daniel Newman, which is interesting because this is, uh, from what I can tell, uh, Gold West, the dice game. Uh, they don't have any images of what this game looks like just yet, but uh, Gold West was designed by J. Alex Kevern, and obviously this new game is not designed by J. Alex Kevern, so it's in the same kind of uh, universe, and for um, I guess all I know, maybe it has similar mechanics to Gold West. That would certainly make sense if they're trying to do a dice game version of it. But uh, looking at the description, it says that um, each round in Rolled West, you will extract goods from the land based on a roll of custom dice. You're going to spend wood to make settlements and secure majorities in different terrain types. You're going to use metal to fulfill contracts and make sales. You're going to invest in a boom town, bank resources on opponents' turns, and uh, mark your choices with dry erase scoreboards. So I, I'm thinking this maybe is not a roll and write style game. I know those are kind of the craze right now. Uh, maybe it is. There are not that many details. But either way, I enjoy dice games in general. And I thought that Gold West had a lot of really cool ideas. Um, I don't think I ever owned that one. Or maybe I did and I gave it away. Uh, I, I liked it. It didn't um, stick around, obviously, for me. But it's a game I would like to play. I wouldn't mind playing more in the future. It had a cool Mancala type mechanism where you got to plan uh, future turns out with your resources. And I'm hoping to see some of that stuff in this game. It says it's 
two to four players in 20 to 30 minutes. So it's obviously going to be a lot uh, quicker of a game than Gold West was, because that was more like 90 to 120 based off of who you played with. And uh, yeah, I'm interested in trying it out. I like um, uh, dice games, and Gold West was certainly a good place to start off. Uh, we can now move on to the next game, which is Runica and the Six-Sided Spellbooks. Uh, now, this one is currently on Kickstarter, I think. Uh, I only know about this one. Well, I mean, I bumped into it on Board Game Geek, but before I even saw it there, I saw Rado's uh, rundown of it, and this game just looked really neat. Uh, you are rolling dice and then drafting those dice and then using the drafted dice in a uh, two-dimensional kind of puzzle thing where you personally are putting the dice down onto different areas trying to make patterns to cast different spells, which will clear off the dice but the dice will give you very special uh, abilities and whatnot, and it just seems like it has a lot of neat ideas. Um, I have not backed the Kickstarter because I'm really trying to back a lot less Kickstarters at this point, but this is a game that I am intrigued by, and uh, uh, you know I'm keeping an eye on because maybe this is something I will try to uh, play at Board Game Geek Con or something like that when I'm at a convention where this might be available because it looked like it had some neat ideas that I would like to try, uh, but obviously I'm not totally sold on it yet because I did decide that not to back it on Kickstarter. Uh, right, we can now move on to the next game, which is Shodo. Now, unlike most of the games that I talk about in this section, this game has already been published. It says 2018 on BoardGameGeek, which is surprising because it was just added to BoardGameGeek. Now, uh, the reason this one is uh, something I'm paying attention to is mostly due to how it looks. They have uh, a nice cover and they have some photos of what this game looks like. And it appears to be a uh, tile placement game with hexagonal tiles. And the tiles are very simple. They are white with kind of a uh, calligraph uh, calligraphic uh, brushstroke on it, like Chinese calligraphy. And as you put these hex tiles together, you are building out these Chinese calligraphy brush strokes. Now, me personally, I have always found Chinese calligraphy to be beautiful, especially um, the really big ones where they you know, do it with very large, uh, kind of like mop style pens. I just, for some reason, I find it uh, just... I really like the aesthetic of those things. And so a uh, tile uh, laying game where you are building out um, these different calligraphy uh, phrases and you're trying to do uh, some pattern building and trying to get the most points for all that stuff, that seems like a cool spot to start from uh, from a thematic perspective. Um, right now, there is no rules on Board Game Geek, so I'm not sure exactly how this one plays. Um, and it says it's being self-published, so honestly, I'm not even sure... Um, how I would uh, be able to try this one out. It doesn't. It says self-published. It doesn't even say a publisher, but I don't know. I'm going to keep my eye on it. Maybe this is one that will pop up at a convention and I could try because um, it, while it might not necessarily be doing anything particularly new, I don't know. It's just eye-catching. You know, that's something that I like to see. And so playing a tiling game, kind of making these uh, different strokes, that's enough for me to be intrigued. All right. We can now move on to the next game. This one is The Search for Planet X. Uh, now, this one is coming out from Foxtrot Games. And they've, they've certainly put out some pretty uh, good games in the past. I think uh, they work with uh, Renegade games a lot. Uh, yeah, Fox in the Forest, Lanterns, and... Uh, various other games that are in their repertoire. Um, so the reason this game uh, stood out to me is not only that, you know, I've liked some of the games from this publisher before, but also the description um, is, is kind of neat. So from a mechanical perspective, this is a game that uses an app. Uh, you have to use an app because they're uh, in this game. This is, I believe, competitive. There is a Planet X that we just, we know based off of how the different um, uh, bodies in the solar system are moving from their gravitational pull that there must be an extra planet way out there in the uh, far reaches of the solar system, and we're trying to find it. Uh, the main uh, category for this game is deduction, and the app that you're playing with kind of dictates the puzzle for that given game, and then everybody is competing to try and deduce out exactly where that planet is. Um, it appears that you will be, um, you, you will have private deduction sheets that you will be writing down your information on, trying to make all of these different conclusions. Um, you can uh, try to uh, it looks like you can conduct searches. Uh, you can also, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a puzzly nature, astronomical investigation, competitive game, you know, just looking at the word salad on this uh, description. And um, there are no uh, images of what this game looks like, but I am intrigued. Uh, I'm not against digital app implementations or um, uh, workings with games. And so this idea that the app is going to dictate a uh, kind of logic puzzle that you are working your way through competitively is enough for me to be intrigued. It says it's two to six players in 60 minutes. So certainly not a overall light game. And yeah, I just want to know more. I like puzzly style games. And this seems like some pretty new ideas uh, for me, at least as far as an app integration uh, perspective is taken. So I want to learn more. All right. We have two more games to talk about. 
Uh, the second to last one is pretty darn simple. This is Through the Ages, New Leaders and Wonders. Uh, so this is the long-awaited expansion to uh, Through the Ages, in particular the uh, new story of civilization, which was the kind of second edition version of uh, Through the Ages, which streamlined some things and made some uh, made numerous small tweaks. Uh, Through the Ages used to be my favorite game, and it's still one of my favorite games. I think it's been knocked down a couple notches uh, because other things have just overtaken it, not necessarily that I, I dislike Through the Ages less than I used to. But the thing about Through the Ages is every time you play it, you will see all of the same cards. It's just the order in which the cards that come out, which will drastically change how one game will play to the next. Now, I have played um, Through the Ages, the new story and the old version combined at least 30 times. So that's part of the reason why it doesn't really hit the table that much anymore. It takes a long time to play, and I have seen so many different game states for this one, so the idea of having new leaders and new wonders to really shake up the gameplay is something that I very much uh, want to participate in. Uh, this game, this expansion was announced, I think, when they uh, released the second edition of this game, which was like three years ago or four years ago at this point. It was a long time ago, and just every year it was like, oh, it's going to come out next year. Oh, it's going to come out next year. So now, hypothetically, it's on Board Game Geek, so that makes it a little bit more official, and I just really want to get this expansion to uh, kind of reinvigorate my desire to play through the ages because it is a brilliant civilization style engine building game, and the idea of having all these extra leaders to play with is just it's just a fun one. Um, honestly, I have played with a, uh, some variety of new leaders and wonders uh, in the unofficial expansions that are um, available that you can play online, uh, but these are going to be the official ones, and yeah, I'm just super looking forward to trying this one out. Uh, so as soon as that one's available, I will definitely be getting a copy. All right, this brings us to the last uh, game to watch that I'll be talking about, and this one is Volcanic Isle. Uh, the publisher for this one is Arcane Wonders, and the reason I'm paying attention to this largely has to do with the uh, general mechanic of the game. Uh, this is a tile laying game, I think, or maybe it's a game that starts with all of the tiles on the map, and then tiles kind of go away, because um, the game is called Volcanic Isle, so it's no surprise to see that volcanoes will be erupting, and based off of how the volcanoes erupt, parts of the island will actually sink into the sea, and I guess probably be discarded from play. Um, the, it's a fully competitive game, and people are building gi uh, gigantic monolithic statues to try and appease the gods, but it looks like how you build these statues will actually dictate how the different volcanoes will erupt. That's kind of all you have to learn about this game on BGG. They do have a one image of the game in play, and it shows a bunch of tiles with a bunch of volcano tokens and a score track. So it's hard to really uh, deduce how exactly this game is going to work, but I'm intrigued. I like tile laying games. I like volcanic eruptions that disrupt things as an overall theme. I've certainly played a few games like that in the past. So I'm paying a little bit of attention to Volcanic Isle to uh, see exactly how it plays and see if this is one that I do want to track down. All right, that's going to finish out this segment, and I think that's going to bring us to the end of this vlog. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this one. It's probably been a slightly shorter one than in the um, uh, previous months. Uh, mostly, I think that's because I only talked about 16 new games versus the, like, 30 that I've covered a couple of the months that have happened previously this year. Uh, but I think 16 new games to be interested in uh, within a given four-week span is still far more than the number of new games that I will play in a four-week span. So uh, that's certainly not a knock on uh, the amount of games and the style of games that are coming out in any way. Um, I can tell you that there were a lot of uh, games to sift through. Uh, for these last four weeks, there was almost 800 entries that I kind of scanned through briefly. It still took a couple of hours to do that, but this is something that I would do anyway, and it's just kind of fun to talk about the stuff that really stood out to me, because... I like sharing my excitement about games to others. Uh, all right, I think at this point we have definitely come to the end of the vlog. Uh, once again, if you have questions that you would like me to answer in future vlogs, then send those over to johngetsgames at gmail.com, and I'll catch you next time. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.